hello again, church. If you have your copy of God's Word, today we're going to read out of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 12, verse 14. And as always, as you are turning to your copy of God's Word, I will read it to you. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. That's so good, we should read it again. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here in your house. I personally, Lord, have enjoyed these last few Sundays, these messages that Pastor Jeff has been preaching. It's getting our church to go back to the basics. And this is one of them. I love this one, that we should make every effort to live in peace with everyone in a world that has different views and and attitudes and all sorts of things that's going on in our world. We should be making every effort to live in peace. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. This message is titled, The Start of Holiness to God. And uh, we are very excited about it. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit placing this message upon Pastor Jeff so that he could preach it to the bride of Christ. And so we give you all the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Brother Brother Harry. Thank you, church. So as you remember, God has kind of led us into a vein, if you will, of of basic teachings. The first uh, three Sundays ago, we talked about walking like Jesus. And if we say that we are in him, we should walk like Jesus walks. We talked about that. Then last week, you know, we talked about the importance of being a good disciple, being a disciple, not a casual, not a cautious, not a a calloused, but a committed disciple. We talked about that, and God kind of led us on in that same vein because I feel like right now in the world, and we are in the world, we are not of the world, we're we're in the world, not of the world, that's what it is, yeah, I was never want to switch those up. We are here but we ain't really here, okay? Our, our, uh, our, our home is in heaven. The Bible tells us there. We are, our home is in heaven. We are anticipating when we can go to be there. But in the meantime, we've got to be here. But I'm finding, when you see what's going on in the news, when you see what's happening with our former president, you see the demonization of people, not just him, but everybody, that uh, seems to be attacked. If you don't agree with uh, the DOJ or the FBI or the CIA or the LGBTQ or whatever it happens to be, you become a target. And it's easy to get mad about that. It's easy to want to lash out. It's easy to want to get on Facebook and say dumb things. Because that's what people on that side do. They say dumb things. And when I say that, it's like I'm talking about the world. The world uh, that lives here and only exists for this place. But you and I don't exist just for here. We have to live here. We have to be engaged here. But we don't have to act like here. And so one of the things that I think God is telling us right now as a church is to be mindful of what He wants from us. And one of those things is holiness. Now, I'm not talking about a denomination, uh, and I'm not talking about a holy roller. You know, that's kind of got a negative connotation. Now, I don't have any problem with the Word of God. I'll tell you, I used to say in church, I haven't said it here, but I used to say in church, this is my Bible, God's Word from above. It tells me of Jesus, the one that I love. I cherish His pages, each one meant for me, as I await Jesus, the one I want to see. I don't have any problems standing up for the Word of God. But understand, there is a responsibility for you and I to do that with holiness. I kind of sounded like a southern evangelist just then. Holiness. Did you like that? Got that little whoomph right there. One pastor wrote these words, and I was reading this just recently. This old preacher said this. In the church, he said, we've traded our upper room into a boardroom, the fire of the Holy Spirit for a warm heater. Our 
prayer meeting for chicken dinners, and we have become as weak as our sweet tea. I always say sweet tea. Weak as our sweet tea. As cold as our soup and as dead as the chicken we eat. That's kind of harsh. We have got to determine in our heart that even given everything that's going on in this world right now, we still have an obligation to our King and our Lord to practice holiness. Now, let me give you a couple of reasons why. Jesus, I mean, uh, God would tell us in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, we'll look at this in a First Peter passage later on. He says, I am the Lord your God. Cr- consecrate yourself. In other words, set yourself apart for holy purposes and be holy. Why? Because I, God says, am holy. He says, I want my people to be set apart for my stuff and I want them to be like me. That's kind of a hard concept for you and I. But again, the Bible's pretty clear. It says, because of one sacrifice is made perfect forever, those who are being made holy. Christ's sacrifice allows you and I to be in the right position and condition to be holy. The Bible also tells in Hebrew 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. If we were made perfect, not that we won't sin, but if we were made perfect in the eyes of God, he said, let us tell folks, let us profess that, let our lives exemplify that as we go on about our day. Then finally, the text that we're looking at tonight, as a result of that, as a result of that, his sacrifice made us perfect through the blood of Christ and we're being made holy. Let us continue to profess that because he's faithful and then we should make every effort to live in peace with all men and women and be what? Holy. And why is that important? Because the author of Hebrews says without holiness... No one will see the Lord. Wait a minute, preacher. I thought you said if I pray to receive Christ and I give my heart to him and he changed me from the inside out, no, no, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. No, no, I never said that. I said that you're saved by grace through faith and I said once you put your faith in Christ, that's the beginning. It's not a one and done deal. We continue to live our life for Christ after that. Yes, we're saved. But as I told one brother just recently, I said some folks that, that just get saved and never grow in their faith, they may enter into heaven, but they'll enter into it smelling like smoke. As if they just slid in there. They missed all the blessings and all the opportunity. God says, I created you to be like me. And he says, if I'm holy, I want you to be holy as well. Now what does holy mean? The word holy is the Greek word hagiadzo. The Greek word, the Hebrew word is kadash, and it means the same thing. It's shown 549 times in the scripture, the word holy does. Kadash in the Hebrew, hagias, sort of sounds like hagendos. I always like to say that. Don't go in there and say, hey, I want your holy ice cream. Okay. Hagias, and it literally means moral and ethical wholeness or perfection, freedom from moral evil. Now understand, that's not based on our standard of moral and ethical wholeness. That's based on God's standard. You follow me on that, right? God says, here is my standard. I'm giving that to you through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now live accordingly. Free or freedom from moral evil. The idea there is To walk the way God walks. Let me give you this as well, right out of Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary. Holiness is one of the essential elements of God's nature required of his people. Did you hear what they said? Required. So when some knucklehead starts getting in your face about this, that, or the other, your response is not to grab them and choke the life out of them, even though that's your desire sometimes. Your desire is to practice and express holiness. You follow me on that? It goes on to say, holiness may also be rendered as sanctification or godliness. We'll look at some verses later on that talk about godliness. It's the same thing. It means, it, the, word, the Hebrew word for holy means sanctified 
or set apart. Remember how I've always said, at the moment of salvation, you were justified. You were forgiven of your sins, and you were, you were cleansed at that point. And then the rest of your life, you're going to be sanctified. You're going to be growing in your faith. Why? Because you're set apart for service to God. You're set apart to God and service for God. It goes on to say, it says, the word holy denotes that which is sanctified or set apart. Why? For divine service and dedicated to God. You're not holy because somebody looks at you and you go, oh, you're so holy. No, you're holy because God says that is my, that is my desire for you as my child. And I, re- I, 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 and I don't say this lightly. I really think if we would practice holiness more regularly in the conversations we have with folks, we might actually draw them to Christ rather than repel them from Christ. Because see, sometimes we get in there and just go toe-to-toe with them, don't we? Well, we got a holiday, so we're never going to talk about politics. We're going to talk about politics. And the minute somebody brings it up, man, you're like, ah, you know. We want all men to be saved. We want all people to come to know Christ. But sometimes we don't practice holiness. Chuck Colson, remember him? Wrote a book called Loving God. He said this, holiness is the everyday business of every Christian. It, 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 evidences itself in that decisions we make and the things we do hour by hour, day by day. Our holiness shows by how we live our life. And not just when we're in church. You know, some folks are that Sunday saint, Monday ain't kind of thing. You know, you, you come in here looking all, you know, and feeling all and acting all, and then you get out there and act like there's everybody else. I'm not, when I say you, I'm just as much talking about me, so don't, please don't feel like I'm picking on anybody here. John Brown wrote this in the Expositor's Discourses of First Peter. He said, oh, I didn't put it up there, I'm sorry. Holiness does not consist in mystical speculation, enthusiastic fervors, or uncommanded atrocities, it, uh, um, austerities. I'm sorry, I guess I always said that wrong. It, it consists of thinking as God thinks and willing as God wills. It's wanting to be like him. And I'm not talking about calling down fire from heaven to nuke your next door neighbor that lets her dog go and do his business on your grass. It's thinking like God and, and acting the way God would want us to act. So I want to break this down for you based on our text here because it says make every effort. So the responsibility is on us. We need to make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy because without holiness no one will see the Lord. So the first thing I want to point out to you, holiness starts with a premise, with a right premise. Holiness does not mean that we won't be tempted because Jesus was tempted. Remember out in the desert, he's there and the devil walks up to him and he says, oh, Jesus, my, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus goes, mm, man will not live on the, on, the, on the bread alone, but on the every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil did that two more times, and Jesus says, no, 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 I, you can tempt me, but I'm not going to fall for your silly tricks there, Satan. So Jesus was tempted. So holiness doesn't mean that we won't be tempted. And by the way, holiness does not mean that we won't have or, or be influenced and in, 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 in exposed to sin. We find that Paul struggled with sin in Romans chapter 7. He says, man, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, that I actually do. How many can get an amen on that one? I am not going to yell at my kids. You know, kids, doctor. Oh. It starts with the right premise. A.W. Tozier said this, the holy person is not the one who cannot sin. A holy person is the one who will not sin. It's a choice. Plain and simple. What is the right premise? Well, first of all, the right premise is God's handiwork and not man's handsomeness. I know, Harry, that kind of blows a hole in your whole theology right there, doesn't it? I know, yeah. What do we mean God's handiwork? God is the one that does the holying. He is the one that makes us holy and gives us the strength to carry on a holy life even when everybody is coming at us with their unholiness. What does the Bible say? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Remember I taught, just mentioned a second ago out of Leviticus. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy, what? In all that you do. 
For it is written right out of Leviticus, be holy because I am holy. Peter even reiterates that fact, that we have an obligation. He's the one that does it. It's not our work. It's not our ability. It's not our good looking nuts. Norm? Amen. Amen. But God's provision. The Bible says, in your, but your iniquities have separated from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that you will not hear. That's an Old Testament thing. What does that mean? When we're responding in an unholy fashion, we're not listening to the, to the word of God. We're listening to the voice of God. Remember I said a few weeks ago, if you're, if, you're, if you're entrenched with sin, the more you get involved, maybe it was a Bible study, may not have been here, but the more you get involved with some kind of sinful activity, the less and less you hear from the, the voice of God. It's not that you're not saved anymore, you're just not hearing from your commander-in-chief, from your king of kings and lord of lords, from your father, from your daddy. Abba, Father, the Bible says. The Bible says that for he, in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, for those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his son. When God called you to salvation, he knew he wanted to make you and I just like Jesus. I don't mean barefoot walking every place he goes. I mean living and responding the way Christ did. So that, uh, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Christ was the example for you and for me. It's, not, it's God's handiwork that allows us to be made holy. He's the one that gives us that in our lives and allows us to walk accordingly. The problem is we're oftentimes going, la, 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 la. Hear no evil, see no evil, have no fun kind of thing. No. The right premise, it's God's handiwork, not our handsomeness. Number two, it's God's heart, not man's head. God is the one that establishes the standard. We can think that we're doing the right thing right up to the point where the word of God uh, over, overrules it. Oh, I can do that. I can get away with that. I, no big deal. I, 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 got, uh, I, I got different insurance the insurance company I had, I found out they were really sticking it to me. And I was pretty ticked off. So I began to shop. Well, they all do it in Michigan, but anyway. Um, but I shopped around. And this one insurance company, they, uh, they gave me a really good rate. They said, we'll give you even a better rate if you'll sign up for our little let us watch you as you drive around the world kind of thing. And, uh, and, and it pretty much guides and directs what it is. If you go too fast or go and make turns, erratic things, you know, they did. And if you just have this in your car... You'll, you'll be a better driver, you get a better rate. Kind of thing. In my head, I'm like, hey, that sounds like a pretty good idea. It's not. It's not. We think in our head that something's going to work out okay, but God says, no, no, I, I want to show you and share with you my heart. That's where this stuff comes from. This where holiness comes from. The heart of God imparted. To you and to me, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You want to turn those fans on? I think folks are getting kind of warm. I see y'all fanning yourselves. Uh, Psalm chapter 5, verse 9. The Bible says and back in the day that, the, that not a word from the mouths of those prophets and those leaders could be trusted. Their hearts were filled with destruction. Their throat was an open grave and their tongue they speak deceit. Leaders, individuals that stood before the people to proclaim the, the, the word of God. And God calls them out and said, no, no, these guys are doing wrong. We have that today. That's why we need to be wise as serpents but gentle as doves, Jesus says. Kind and compassionate, but also be paying attention because it's the heart of God that he wants us to gravitate to, not try to figure out in our own brain matter. The Bible says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Then he goes on to say, but praise the Lord, I didn't. Cherish that sin. Some folks try to hang on to their sin. They try to make it palatable. God says, I don't want you to, to be that. I want you to be holy. Holy. Let her see it's God's honor, not man's hooray. You know what I mean by that? God wants for us to be holy. And he doesn't, want it to base, he doesn't want us to base it off of our, oh, look how, what a great job we're doing. Or, Lord, look at me, look at me. Lord, look how holy I'm being. 
He wants his people to be humble, be servants, be kind and compassionate. And the world needs to see that from you and I. I get frustrated like you do sometimes, especially at a fast food restaurant. They're paying them folks $15 an hour and they still can't hear. Scary stuff. If you want to learn holiness, just go into Burger King. No, I didn't say Burger King. I said fast food. God wants for us to practice that. God wants us to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to live according to that. He tells us in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, the Lord says, These people come near me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is made up only of rules taught by men. Isaiah was told by God, chastising the people that are saying, you're, giving, you're, you're, you're talking the talk, but you're not walking the walk. Ooh, that theme keeps coming back, doesn't it? What about this one? Romans chapter 6, verses 20 and 23. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. Now, what does that mean? When you're a sinful person, you're slave that sin, right? You keep living that sin, you keep walking that sin, you keep enjoying that sin, so, so. And when you're like that, then you're not really living in a righteous, with a righteous type life. So he's saying, you are free from the control of righteousness. Because let's face it, when you start living a righteous life, when you start living a life of honor and glorify God, when you try taking God at his word and actually living life accordingly, you're going you're gonna to gravitate to that. So you're either going to serve the devil or you're going to serve God. You've got to choose. You, you're going to serve somebody. Wasn't that what that guy said a long time ago? I'm not going to mention his name because... Lightning will probably come down. Anyway, but he says, what benefit did you reap from the time, from these things that you're now ashamed of? The sin that we used to practice, that we don't want to brag about or give, give uh, oh man, look at all the things I did when I was back in the day. It goes on to say, those things result in death. We know the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, but now you have been set free from sin and become slaves to God. Now, people at least look at that and say, I enslaved nobody. Really? When you gave your heart to Christ, you gave him the deed to your life. And what do we know about the guy that holds a deed? He makes the rules. We gave him ownership. We gave him ourselves. And we said we want it that way. God, I'm going to live my life for, for you from this day forward. I stood right in the front of a church and said that. Many of you did too. And then we complain about it. Slave of God. I don't mind serving the Lord. Do you mind serving the Lord? Anyone here mind? Raise your hand if you mind serving the Lord. Look what else it says. You're going to become a slave to God. The benefit you reap, what? What? Leads to holiness. You mean if I just simply start taking God at his word and start listening to what he says and start, start practicing some of these things that he talks about? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. Yeah, that leads to holiness. And the result is eternal life, the Bible says. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus the Lord. Mm, that sounds really familiar. Starts with the right premise. Number two, starts with real professing. Starts with real professing. What does it mean to profess? I ask and then pause. What does it mean to profess something? Not confess. Okay, yes, I took the pie off the windowsill. Boy, is that example dated. If y'all put a pie on a windowsill, let me know. I'll swing by, I promise. Anyway. Professing means to openly declare one's belief. I mean, it's a simple definition to just basically say, look, this is what I believe. As I said last week, many folks try to shame us into keeping our mouths shut, and now is not the time to do that. Now more than ever, we must profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I am not ashamed of the gospel, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, for it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Guess what? You and I are, Jew are Gentiles. We're all Gentiles. Except a couple folks come to our church, they're converted Jews. Real professing. Not fearful, not afraid, not backing up. And not relying on something else like, oh, uh, I'll just bring them, I'll just take them to the church or I'll, I'll send them a, a, a book or I'll give them an email. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is to send a non-believer a Bible and say, have at it. 
If you don't sit down with them and explain that book, they're going to start in Genesis, and they're going to read about seven chapters, and they go, I had enough of this. And if they ever get through Genesis and then get to Leviticus, oh, buddy, we're dead meat at that point. Remember how I used an example a few weeks ago? I walked into Home Depot. I was looking for something. And they go, well, you go down the aisle here, and you take a left, and you go over there. And, you, and I go, well, you know, Home Depot is not the easiest place to navigate. But every once in a while, there's somebody say, hey, man, let me take you where you need to go. Walk you right to it there. Bam, you got it. You're on the way. Same thing there. Why? What am I trying to tell you? Well, programs don't last. If you're just relying on some kind of program, some kind of event, some kind of thing, without investing in the life of an individual, without professing Christ yourself, you are doing a disservice to that individual. You've heard me say before, people are not going to care what you know until they know that you care. Programs don't last. James chapter 2. Someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by what I do. Notice James wasn't saying that my, what I do is my faith. He says, I have faith and consequently I put that faith in action. The idea of just trying to rely. And I mean, believe me, you know, if, you, if, you, if that's all you can do is say, hey, come with me to church and I'll take you out for lunch afterwards. That's fine. But we got to be professing Christians. Professing. Telling what you believe. I love the fact that y'all are getting these signs. Man, these things have been going out here like hotcakes. I am shocked that folks have been so cool to take one of these things and put them in their front yard. When uh, Dennis and, and, and uh, said back there in, in their neighborhood, they were driving through their neighborhood, and one of those signs was in somebody else's head. They gotta go, I got to go by and see who actually goes to the church. Of course, they're taking one with them too. But, but that, that's openly professing Jesus Christ. Programs don't last but pretending doesn't liberate. And what I mean by that, if you don't believe something, by all means, don't try to profess it. You will be exposed for what you are. The Bible says this, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Look what he says. By their fruit, you will recognize them. What's he saying? He's saying a false prophet is going to expose himself eventually for what they are. He says, you'll recognize them. Do people pick grapes, grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruits, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good or bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I know that sounds like a lot of things, but really, what is it? An apple tree makes apples. If that apple tree doesn't make apples, it's not a very good apple tree, is it? It may have the bark and the leaves and everything, but if it's not producing apples, it is not a good tree. A Christian that says they're a Christian but never professes Christ? There's something wrong there, gang. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day. What day? On the day of judgment. Lord, Lord, uh, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons, perform many miracles? Lord, didn't we have all the actions and so on and so forth? Believe me, the devil can do those kind of things too. But what's going to be the determining factor when God looks down and says, you know what, I never knew you. You may have acted like it. You may have pretended that you were a believer. But the fact of the matter is, is now that it's all said and done, you were living a lie. And now in front of me, he says, you're going to be exposed for what you are. Wow. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Real professing, that's the beginning. And profession doesn't lose. I've often wondered why we have so few, much fewer decisions for Christ. And I think it's because we're way too quiet. You know what most folks will tell me when they, when they, when they, when they hear the gospel, when they hear the gospel the first time? Said, I just, I didn't even know this stuff existed. Said, I had neighbors that, that go to church every Sunday. They never talked to me about Jesus Christ or anything like that. Many folks are just waiting for someone to say, what do you believe? 
Remember, lost people are lost and act lost because they're lost. They need someone to profess. Profession, the idea of professing your faith will not go by the wayside. Romans chapter one, verse 18 through 25. I know, I'm sorry these are big verses. I want to read them to you rather than you know, trust you to read them yourself. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godly, godless and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. God's going to deal with those who are following another gospel or, 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 or pretending that they're actually a believer. Since what may be known about God has been plain to them because God has made, no, made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, that's his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what is made so that men are without excuse. You know what he's saying there? There's no reason that somebody should not call out to a holy God just by looking around at the stuff around them. Every time in the, I'm in the woods, man, I just, I, God, you are awesome. He made birch trees that got little eyeballs on them. If you know anything about a birch tree, it's the coolest thing. You're like, that, that tree's looking at me. It's kind of freaky. All the animals and all the things. He, I mean, you can't help but go in the woods and just say, God, you, you did all this for me? Wow, and I brought nothing for you except myself. He was basically saying there's no reason a man and a woman shouldn't, shouldn't just call out to God just by things going on around him. It's plainly seen. So men are without excuse. It goes on to say this. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's what a sinful person does. They can act religious, but no relationship. And what will happen is they'll get less and less and less in tune with the things going on around them. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Idols. He goes on to say, therefore God gave them over to the sinful, the sinful desires of their heart. God says, you want to follow those kind of things? Fine, that's on you. I've made myself available. You're without excuse. You can look and see me in every corner of this planet. And in every mouth of the profession Christian, you can see me and you can hear from me and you can know me. But if you choose to reject that and you go on about your way, fine, I'll give you over to the depravity of, of the sinful desires of their hearts, to, to sexual impurity, uh, degrading their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and served, and served created things rather than the, thing, than the creator who is ever praised, who is ever to be praised. Amen. They would rather stand in big cathedrals with fancy statues and go, oh, ah, ooh. And get on their face before God and say, God, like that tax cleaner in the temple, he says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Starts with real professing. In the days of Israel, they had no king and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Unfortunately, we got people now that want to be king. But there's only one king, and he's the king of kings and lord of lords. The Bible tells you and I that we were once in darkness, but now the light of the Lord. But now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. That's the holiness we're talking about. Be exposed to this world, and they would see and be drawn to you and me. The final thing I want to point out to you on your outline is holiness starts with regular prayer. Many folks say, where do I go? What do I do? You start praying. If we were honest, if we, and I said we in, in, in general, if we were honest, we don't pray nearly enough. Now we're doing a lot better as a church. Ladies are getting together on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. Men are getting together at 7.30 on Friday mornings. We've got Bible studies and all kinds. We're praying church. I don't, I'm not discounting that at all. But if we want to be holy, if we want to exemplify what it means to walk with God, it's got to have regular prayer tied to that. Seeking the will of God. The first thing is assured of Christ's delivery. Are you saved? Are you born again? Not are you a Methodist or a Catholic or a Presbyterian or a Pentecostal or anything like that. Are you saved? The assurance of Christ. 
The Bible tells us, as a believer, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. That's not a name it, claim it kind of thing. It's not saying, well, oh, you know, uh, well, God says if I ask for it, I'll get it. We ask in accordance with his will, in accordance with his will. Remember we talked about holiness? Holiness is thinking like God thinks and, 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 and acting like God acts and willing like God wills. Sure of Christ's liberty. He said, I'm going to give it to you. But you've got to make sure your heart's right first. Yeah, the next thing is when it comes to regular prayers that we've got to have an attitude of complete dependence. Go back to our text. Make every effort to live at peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. You see, you were given something very special at the moment of salvation. You were given the heart of God. The problem is, is that we, 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 we treat it like it's got to be something over here rather than something that's supposed to be right here. And our attitude needs to be total and complete dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we can't do it. We already said it's, not, it's, not, it's his handiwork, not our handsomeness, that allows us to be holy. And having that attitude. You've heard this passage numerous times. I've preached on it before. It was a promise that was given specifically to the nation of Israel at that particular time. I still believe that the God that they serve is the God that we serve. And if we would do the same thing, I think God would do this. But this particular promise was to the nation of Israel at that time. He said, if my people, the Israelites, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, where's the responsibility? On us. Our nation does, if you, if you try to promote this right now, I mean, people would absolutely cut your liver out. What? Me depend on God? We better start. Because we are circling the bowl, ladies and gentlemen. The thing that we would have regarded as perverted just 10 years ago, now are commonplace. Chino Valley, right now, the school, the school system there said, we're going to notify parents if their kids want to start identifying at school as transgender. And it, was, it Chino, was it Chino? Is, is that what, did they get right? Yeah. In California, I was like, hey man, hallelujah. There's hope for the land of fruits and nuts. Anyway, um, they did this and the government has gone after them. So how dare you involve parents in these kids' lives? What? They're not willing to humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. They like it. But praise God, there's still school boards out there doing, trying to do the right thing. Parents still are parents, plain and simple. The government's never intended to be somebody's, some kid's parent. Anybody that tells you differently is flawed. That young kid that was wearing the Gadsden flag on his backpack at school went after him with a vengeance. Nutty. So if we would turn back to God, maybe God would indeed heal our land. Maybe that's why we're supposed to be telling this stuff to other people. It goes on to say, uh, turn their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven. And what? Forgive their sin? I'll heal their land. Sound like a pretty good deal to me. What about this one? Mark chapter 9, verses 23 through 29. This guy came to Jesus. He said, Jesus, if, he, if you can heal me, man, I sure would appreciate it. He says, if I can. You mean if I can. Everything is possible for him who believes. You say, can, could we actually turn the nation around? Sure. Do you realize the churches outnumber? We're a, we're a, we're a majority in this world. 36,000 different denominations in the United States right now. And whenever you got God, you're in the majority. We could turn this ship around. Christ is coming back someday soon. A lot of folks are going to be caught off guard. But with God, all things are possible. We've just got to decide that we're going to be holy as he is holy. And encourage others to do the same. Let me give you uh, uh, he, he, he says, He said, uh, possible for him to believe. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my belief. And when Jesus saw the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit. He said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked there in verse 26. And convulsed that little boy violently and he came out. And the boy looked much like a corpse, and when he said, he's dead. But Jesus took him up by the hand and lifted his, to his feet, and he stood up. And then Jesus, 
After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him probably, why couldn't we drive this out? Why couldn't we do this, Lord? As he says, this kind of thing only happens through real serious prayer. Can you imagine what would happen if we began to practice holiness and actually bathe it in prayer, the things that we do. And, the thing, and, the, and, I, and I believe we do that. Bible studies, things that we're doing, you know, Harry and I pray and, and we really want to see God just be glorified through, uh, through this church and in this community. But what would happen if we all got on the same page and began to say, you know what, I want to be a part of God's, what God's doing there at that church. Maybe we'd start seeing some pretty amazing things as well. Oh, we're seeing lives change. We're seeing marriages being healed. We're seeing a lot of things happen. How much more would God do through his people if we simply got serious about regular prayer and practiced holiness? Action. Regular prayer. Make sure that Christ is, make sure that you're saved and trust that God is going to deliver whatever that is. Have an attitude of complete dependence and an action of calling directly, going to the throne of God in your own life. People will come and say, Pastor, would you pray about this? And I love praying. When you ask me to pray, I'll pray for that. I'll stop right then. Boom, let's pray. Or if I'm driving down the road, I may pray with you. I may say, let me stop, <laughs> you know, because... 96 is a death wish for closing your eyes on the highway. Though so anyway. But praying and having that heart of saying, Lord, I, I, when you ask me to pray for you, the first thing I always want to know is, are you praying for this yourself? That's the important thing. Ask us to pray. Brother Harry and I pray. All of our deacons will pray. All of our elders pray. Absolutely. But make sure you're praying yourself. You're the first line of defense. And you're the first place of attack. Jeremiah 3, 33, 3, call on me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you did not know. God's promise. You pray to me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expose you to things you had no idea. You had no idea. James 5, 16 Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. <gasps> really? Our men's accountability group on Tuesday, and I'm so proud of them. They're, they're encouraging one another, dealing with the things in their life and having other men come alongside of them. Pray for one another, encourage one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective, not in our strength but in using the strength of God that's imparted to us as we practice holiness. I was reminded of a story. I'm going to close with this. My bottom line here is make every effort to live in peace with everyone. You're going to have to stand up for certain things. You're going to have to call out sin, sin sometimes, but the way we do it is going to go a long way. He says, because without holiness, no one sees the Lord. Without that relationship with Christ and without walking according to that, if you if you're not desiring to live a holy life, not a boring life, not walking around in some wool shirt or some long robe with, you know, the, the uh, going for silence for a year, that's not what holiness is. But actually practicing these things, because he says, if a person doesn't want to do that, they're probably not saved and they will not see the Lord. I close with this story. This young teacher had just graduated from one of our wonderful institutions of higher learning. She got in front of a classroom of fifth graders. And she goes, I just want you all to know that I am a liberal and I'm an agnostic. No, I'm an atheist. I'm sorry, not an agnostic. An atheist. I, started, I thought, rethought that. An, an atheist. And then she paused and she said, now, you all want to be like your teacher, right? Now, if you don't think this stuff is happening in schools, think again. She says, I am a liberal, I am an atheist, and you all want to be like me, right? Well, the kids are like, well, yeah, 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 yeah. So they're all like raising their hand. Yeah, sure, I want to be like my teacher. Everyone wants to be like your teacher, right? Except one little girl back there. And the lady teacher got kind of mad about it. She says, well, what about you? You don't want to do this? And she goes, no, I, I don't want to be that. Well, why not? 
She says, because I'm a Christian. Oh, well, that just bowed her up, man. She's like, oh, well, you're a Christian, huh? Well, what makes you think you're a Christian? Or how come you're a Christian? And the girl says, well, said, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And I grew up in a family where my mom and dad were Christian. Grew up in a family where they read to me the Bible each night. We prayed over meals. And we go to church on a regular basis. So I'm a Christian. She goes, that's ridiculous. If you're... You say your mom and dad were, 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 were reading the Bible. If your mother was a moron and your dad was a moron, what would that make you? And she says, probably make me a liberal and an atheist. <laughs> Holiness, a basic, the Christian faith. I may have left you with more questions than answers, I don't know. But it makes sense to me. I want to be like Christ. And I, I, I want to teach our church to be like Christ. Because without holiness, the Bible says, we won't see the Lord. Or even sadder yet, if we are a believer and we don't want to want, live in holiness, we might miss some huge opportunities and huge blessings from God. So this is the start of holiness. I hope you'll think about it. Because I've been thinking about it a lot. Let's pray together. Father God, it's in the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit that we humbly bow right now. You have told us to make every effort to live in peace with everyone. And God, there's no little asterisk there that tells us that that means only people that agree with us or that means only people that look like us or that makes, means people that are only from, from, from where we live or, or from our town or whatever. Lord, you said make peace, live in peace, not compromise, not tolerance, but the willingness to love those who may not necessarily be, that may not necessarily be lovable, to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. And Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would flood us tonight with that desire to live holy lives for your glory and for your honor. God, our world's in trouble and they need the church. They need Christ, but to, you've given the church to the world so that the world would see you. So may four winds be that place that practices holiness. And Father, may you be pleased with your church. We love you, Father. We pray for those here tonight that may not know you, that they would have the willingness and the courage to come and talk to me after the church service so that they can settle that in their hearts and have a home waiting them in heaven. Father, I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for tuning into our channel. I hope you'll take a few minutes and get your copy of God's Word because we're going to open it, we're going to look at it, and we're going to understand what God has to say to us. It's going to be a great day. Thanks for watching. God bless.